dealing with the opcode register and building the clock and phase control uh, for our processor. So the opcode register uh, can fit in this space here. So previously I thought this space was going to be used for the program counter incrementer, but yesterday we built that directly above the program counter register because that turned out to be really convenient. Today we're going to build this uh, opcode register above over here. So to do that we're going to copy in more of our D-type latches, which are over here. To do that, I need to write down the coordinates of where it's, go where it's coming from, and then I need to write down the coordinates of where we're going to, and then I can do the clone. So same, same process as always with this cloning stuff. Um, so we're coming from 125, 33, 110, and oh, uh, but I need to pick the low coordinate for this, uh, so really it's 109. Uh, it's the left hand side, and then the upper coordinate uh, will be on this side. And we just need to make sure we're going one block above, so we're getting that redstone uh, in there. So the upper coordinate is uh, 1, 4, 3, 38, 110. Okay, so that's where we're copying from, and now we're going to go over to where we're copying to, and we're going to just need four of these bits. Um, doesn't massively matter where I place them in here, uh, but I will sort of try to measure out a little bit so that they're kind of reasonably centered. It does matter how far forward or backward I go because otherwise it will run into these uh, data lines, data bus, or the arithmetic unit. So for four bits I need eight blocks, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, so I can shave one off either side, one, two, three, four, Yeah, that gives me eight blocks, and then I need to pick the forwards, backwards, kind of in and out distance. So when I look over here, what I built before, this is where the lamp was aligned, and it was one, two, three, and I'm copying essentially four blocks uh, back from that. So I'm copying four blocks behind the lamp, so I need to work out what line that is over here relative to the others. So one, two, three, this is the fourth one back. Uh, so that's on line, uh, oh that's interesting, it's on line 33 as well. Um, it turns out I copied it directly across before, that's useful. So we're going to copy the first bit into here, um, which is 134, 33, 16, Right, um, so yeah, let's see whether this works now. So we're going from 125.33.109 to 143.38.110.134.33.16. Bam. And when it stops getting annoyed about my head being stuck in the middle of a block, it will allow me to save that. Okay, so... Oh, that's interesting. Hmm, I'm misaligned by one block. Oh well, we'll just copy back over that. Um, so one block this way is 135. I must have miscounted somewhere. There we go. Okay, so that's our first bit for our opcode register. Uh, yeah, we have unfortunately destroyed part of this line in the process, uh, but that's not really going to matter. Uh, we'll rebuild it in a moment. It 
it's what powers this clear line coming down here. Um, so it's, you know, we need this basically. Um, yeah, so it goes repeater, torch on block. This is a repeater. And and we have torch on a block like this and this coming down here. So let's copy in our other bits. So we're just going across two each time. Here we go, and then we'll rebuild this line in here. There was a repeater in here somewhere, but I'll figure that out. So if I place Switch behind, see where the power runs out. Okay, so that's the uh, D-type flip-flops for our opcode register, and I can now link up the data lines coming from here. And the thing I need to do is make sure I get these data lines the right way round, because uh, I've got this wrong before, so I don't want to get it wrong again. So the low bit is on the right hand side. And the high bit is on the left hand side. So this should just be a case of running this along and up to meet this line here. here, we go. Interesting. This off by one. I want them all to look the same, basically. That's all I'm fussing about. Gap of two. Odd. Okay, and our data coming from memory at the moment is all ones, which is going to be useful because it will allow me to work out where these repeaters will need will be needed. So, first repeater is here. Yeah, next. And that's a nice pattern going across. Uh, that's that's good. And then these will need repeaters just as before. So that's the um, basic setup for our opcode register. We now need to build that uh, kind of enable setup and clear and clear setup. Uh, so we step it down as a ladder and build some repeaters as the first step. We've built all of this before essentially. Um, hmm. Now this repeater is way far back, 
so I don't know whether that's going to provide enough power. Uh, oh, and it does. Okay, well that's useful. And then we need the various signals to control this. So that's a two tick repeater, these are both one tick repeaters. And again, that's just because of the way the timing works on these registers. They're a bit timing sensitive. Um, I'm not entirely happy about the fact that they're completely timing sensitive in this way, but I don't really have the effort to design them differently. Oh, no, that's supposed to be that further back, I think. And this goes like this. Like this. All in one. Yeah. And then we have two switches. So these are the clock and enable lines. So if we enable this and save, and we'll see that the data output from here is uh, wrong. Why is that not correct? What have I done wrong? All these inputs are the same, so I don't understand why this one bit is Incorrect. A bit odd. Theory, these are, should all be in the same state, but something about those torches must have burnt out and stopped them functioning. Really? Why is this? A bit strange, that first copy went wrong in some way and caused it to break. Uh, a little bit worrying, but... Well, we'll just have to see. Okay, so all of these are inverted outputs and that's not actually what we want uh, from the opcode register because um, well basically the, the opcode register is going to be 
decoded. Actually, is it what we want? So we've got to decode this into 16 separate signals and we've seen before that the way to decode something is um, by placing the kind of repeaters and torches pattern like this. So maybe it doesn't really matter whether this is inverted or not. We'll just pick a different ordering for how we use the wires, I guess. Um, I'm now just trying to see whether there's um, an alignment that will work here for these. Because we've got to extract these wires out above. So that's going to power it when we don't want it to. But this is just going to have to wind its way up. So this one should be okay. And this one will hopefully now. Yep. One. Ah, there's a slight issue because we need to, we would want to place a block there to Cut it off, um, but that's not going to work. Uh, so this this line has to be going backwards into this, otherwise it doesn't work. Um, Hopefully that produces enough separation. Just going to see whether this connects up in a way I don't intend it to. It hasn't. Good. That gets us our four bits and step these up. One more and place repeaters. That's our opcode register, um, reading from memory, storing the opcode, and then giving us uh, the inverted result. And now we need to decode that into 16 separate signals 
Um, and take up a lot of space. But this is eight wide, uh, but we're losing two of them. So six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So it's going to take us all the way over to this uh, level here, basically, to do this decode. And what I'd like is to have these control signals above the thing we're decoding. Um, that will make it easier. I'm just going to go and build more test of what I want to do. So if I've got my two value lines coming in here and then I need to be decoding these into four signals above like this. And this absolutely has to be the spacing because otherwise this is going to take up way too much room. Oh, I built too many. Uh, one, two, three. Oh, <laughs> I built six when I meant to build four. Okay. So, uh, for each of these, I want to say maybe give myself a bit more room above so I can place torches. say the first one, zero, zero, for example, will be this going into this. That's just an AND gate, uh, really straightforward. So this will be 16 ticks of delay if I do that. Um, 16 ticks is quite long. In fact, it's very long. Um, don't really want to do. It would be better if I could do this just as a continuous wire coming through and somehow find a way to power that. is I think if I turn that off, yeah, I get an oscillator because of this powering back into its, into the wire next to it. Um, hmm. Oh, that's not going to work because uh, maybe I just have to use repeaters here to get the spacing. This will be uh, line one. And to make that work, uh, how do I pass power up like this? I do that. Oh, so that powers the block next to it. That's interesting. I did not know that. Oh, that's how that's working. Huh. Oh, but that's going to going to interfere. Yep, 
yeah, that still interferes when I do that, which isn't good. Um, Ah. Oh. There was another bit here. either a so there's always an inverter here and then it's whether it connects or not this becomes gate that way uh, so this is the wrong way around and this should have been inverted Do this the wrong way. I did it the wrong way around again. There we go. Then the repeater always have a torch on a block. One one is this. One both of them to be on. Oh. Yep. And this. This one becomes the opposite. So we've got uh, hopefully zero, one, two, three. There we go. So that decoder is going to work. It's not the most efficient thing in the world, um, but it'll be good enough. Uh, as I've said throughout, this isn't intended to be a super efficient design of machine. Um, so we can build the first and see where we can build this first line of decode, get it as far out as possible. Um, 
just needs to go straight into an inverter. Each of these can be our first inverters and our data will come across at this level. Nothing, just a repeater on every other block. We give us 16 decoded lines. So uh, we've got one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven. I got that right. One, two, three, four, five, six. And we don't need the final column. And I'm just going to clone this across to the others, building the basics. In each case we have, looks a bit like this. Okay, so I'm copying from this position. Again, just writing down the coordinates. So 1574315. Copy that to uh, from there to this position is 1884716. And we're copying that two blocks over each time. And I don't know whether that's going to include the underlying iron blocks or not. Uh, I'll figure it out. If it fails, then we know it didn't. Uh, did. Great. Uh. Normally it gives you a non-overlapping warning, but for some reason it didn't on that one. Maybe it's because none of the blocks actually collided. It does a per block non-overlap test, that is ridiculous. Surely it should just be doing a bo bounding box space test. But that also hasn't copied the iron blocks underneath. Um, so I need to go Y one lower. So hopefully that's now done that, yeah. And we can do that for the other two lines. So 11, 9. 
And now I just need to fill in the the codes as well as uh, building these kind of outputs. So each of these lines represents a different instruction, as we saw in the final uh, couple of episode design episodes. Um, we now have 16 signals, one for each uh, for each instruction. Only one of them is on at a time. They come directly from the opcode register. So when we uh, save a new instruction into them, they'll immediately start getting decoded while we're doing the program counter increment. And that's where the timing for this machine is possibly a bit different from other Minecraft Redstone machines. Um, this one, the program counter increment can be happening while the decode is actually happening. Um, in real processes, this is a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit like pipelining. It is not actually pipelining properly, um, but it's a little bit like pipelining. Um, it's a similar kind of idea. We've got the decode happening. Oh, uh, oh, I built these all in slightly the wrong place. Um, damn. So in pipelining, we have something where we fetch an instruction, we decode it, and then you know we do each stage, and we're actually fetching a new instruction while executing the previous instruction. So say, for example, we fetch an add instruction. Uh, the add doesn't use the memory, so we can actually use the memory cycle available on the next clock uh, to fetch another instruction and start decoding it while the add operation completes. Um, uh, I probably should have placed redstone dust on these before I clone them, never mind. So in this case, we're not really doing proper pipelining because we're not fetching and executing multiple instructions at once. Um, you know, our instruction throughput here is uh, one instruction for every three clock cycles, um, which is really poor. Uh, like real processors aim for ideally one or higher, you know, one instruction per cycle or higher. Don't all achieve that. Um, but it depends what kind of processor you're looking at. Okay, so I can start to decode this now um, using the pattern we saw before. So when we want zeros, we put a torch on a block. And when we want ones, we put uh, just a wire. So this first one is zero, 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 zero. The right hand side is the low bit. Uh, so Zero, one, two, three, daisy, four, five, six. Oh, uh, yeah, seven, eight. And all right, then and then eleven and uh, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and then a one is a bit of dust, so. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 
And to finish that off, we then place blocks on each of these and we'll place dust on top of those. Okay, and then dust on top of each of these blocks and the end blocks. Okay, and now we can place the torches on the end and we get our 16 decoded signals, one for each instruction. And I now need to uh, cut off the inputs from the operator code register and test that each of these is correct and in the right order. So it's really important that these decode signals are in exactly the right order because they tell us which instruction is which. And if I mess up the order, then anything we program the memory with will get decoded into the wrong instructions and obviously then our program won't work uh, when, we, when we go to use it. So I'm going to um, put switches and oh. They have to be connected to wires, don't they? Of course they do. Let's do it down here instead then. This is zero. Hoping it was going to be zero. Um, yeah, that's instruction zero. And now we just go through testing. Instruction one, two, I'd be able to make this easier if I place some lamps on the end. That's instruction two, we're doing zero based indexing here. This is instruction three. Five. Six. Seven. It'll be eight. Again, zero based indexing, so we count nine along. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Instruction ten, hopefully. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, so ten. Which means it should be the eleventh one, two, three, four. Five. Yeah, so see, we've got 16, so if I count back, that gets us to 11. Um, faster, then 12, 
12, 4, good, values 12, instructions number 13. Last two, almost there. And we know that we've decoded 1111 correctly because that was our original input. Okay, so the decoder is working exactly as desired, um, except that the order I've just read those out is inverted. So this is actually instruction zero. Um, wondering whether there's somewhere I can place these. It will let me place them on top of redstone apparently. So this is in instruction zero and what I'm going to do is pull up the instruction listing um, from our spreadsheet and use that to build the signs here so that I know exactly which instruction is which. When I come to doing the uh, control path tomorrow, this will be extremely useful uh, to actually have all of these labelled. Because the control path, as you will have seen, is some confusing circuitry. Um, it goes kind of all over the place. Uh, Two, three, four, five, LDAP, yep, a six, LDAI, seven, LDBI. There's a pattern to all of these names, obviously. Um, you know, STAI, store, A register, immediate, meaning adds the O reg to uh, the B reg. Um, yeah. Everything's structured like that so that you can easily understand. Yeah, so BR means branch, uh, BRZ means branch if zero, BRN branch if negative, uh, BRB branch to the value in the B register. Um, so obviously not all of these are immediately obvious. If you've never seen an instruction listing before, you'll take a bit of time to learn how to read them um, but to anyone familiar with how instruction sets and assembly code works uh, the, the patterns are fairly easy to spot once you've had a very brief introduction and ST and LD meaning load and store are fairly common and everything else so yeah um, I should say this particular architecture was designed by Professor David May at the University of Bristol um, as part of the teaching there it's quite similar to some of his other architectures, uh, like the original InMOS transputer and subsequently the XMOS processor and various others. Uh, this particularly the prefix instruction here is kind of a standard thing in his architectures. Not that other architectures don't have prefix instructions, it's just the style of doing it for the operand register and everything is uh, kind of his way of designing things and it works really well. Right, so that's our decoder, and uh, yeah, now we need to do the shift register in order to build our block phases. So our shift register is just another data uh, thing, except that the Output from one bit is chained into the next, and the clear signal is the opposite on one of the bits. Um, so I'm just trying to decide where I build that. Uh, well, why don't we just build it above and in this space here? It will fit quite nicely because um, it's just its own unique circuitry. Uh, you know what? If I 
build it right in the middle then where the clock control is will be and, and the clear control will be exactly um, kind of near the middle of our processor. So I'm going to line it up with this and I'm going to come back here and I want to see if I can find those coordinates I wrote down at the start. Yep. And so if I can get this right, then I want it to exactly line up with the mm, yeah, I'll line it up with the opcode below. Shall I? I'll put it here. I'm a little bit indecisive on this one. So 176 is my limit, otherwise I'll bash into it. Um, this takes up a space of, uh, what is that, 18? So if I'm at 100 and, I'm at 166 and I come back another 18, that gives me 148. as the starting point, a Y of 55. Uh, yeah, if I go right back to the beginning, um, a Y of 55 and uh, 148. There we go, that's the first bit of our shift register floating in midair. And the only thing I've not done here is uh, it's not copied the underneath bit because we didn't need that originally. So I'm going to lower this by one um, and now it will copy in the, the kind of base plate with the redstone on it. Um, yeah. And we need three bits for our shift register and output from this one which is inverted if we recall uh, so the output from this one comes up and over to this one figure out where the repeat is needed in a moment Could have left it on this line here. This won't be needed because oh yes it will. Uh, oh it will because uh, we've got to bring the bit back around. Uh, but we'll break that off there, and this one we can bring in to here I guess. Or it doesn't connect. Find it. I'm just going to manually clear this somehow. Oops. Peter in there. And then this one, we do the same kind of thing. Peter in there. Back here. Okay. And then the last thing is to take this bit, bring it up and over the existing bits, and loop it around to here. There 
So here we can see exactly how this shift register works, like the, the output from one comes up and over the output of the next. And then it loops around. So a normal shift register, you have a bit coming in the bottom and you have bits coming out the top. Uh, you've got a single bit coming out the top and everything just shifts across and then gets dropped out. In this case, it's a looped shift register, um, which is a, probably a bit unusual. Um, but anyway, it works. Oh, the power runs out one block short. Let me see whether I can do anything to avoid having the extra repeater in there. So again, vertical doesn't seem to affect uh, Minecraft power for some reason. Oh, uh, why don't I just go... That's why I don't... Am I still one block short? Oh, I'm still one block short because I didn't move the repeater a block forward. There we go. Uh, and now I want to set up the shifter so that one of these bits is different. Um, and it will be the first bit that's going to be different. So, um, yeah, how do I do that? Doesn't power the block underneath it. But I want it so that when I hit the clear, this um, actually turns on that's the clear disabled that's giving it a constant one which is not what I want hmm So, uh, we enable the clear. Oh, I know what I can do. I can put the clear into this. Ah. That ought to work. As long as I break that connection.
Oh no, that's not going to work. Because when the clear is on, it then disables the bit permanently, stopping it shifting around. Oh, this design was not intended for this use case. Um, I want all the clear into here, right? Uh, that's what that's what I'm trying to do. Um, have a bit more room. Put power into that one. Crack the power like that. And if I break that connection, is this going to get powered? No. And... What I need is for this to be the inverse of the clear signal. And for this to be the actual clear signal. So that's enabling the Is that enabling the clear or disabling it. Uh, oh no, that just needs to be. Maybe it just needs to be. Uh, I've lost track of what I'm trying to do. Um, Clear should be disabling this input basically. Uh, maybe this has to be double inverted to make that work. Let's push this right back uh, here. Uh, and the power's got to come in. this we invert once do that Verse again, and uh, and that's trying to work it out. So, if the input bit is a one. 
it, all, all of this was working in inverted logic somewhere along the way, but so if this coming in as a one and the previous, this will be a zero, so this will be a one, unless the clear is on, in which case I want it to be a zero, uh, but actually I want it to be a one. I need the clear to disable this, I think. On this block. Nope. Aye, aye, aye. I'm confused. I'm just going to try this. I think this might be correct. No, it can't because I, I want it to be or not clear. No, I want it to be or. Clear is off. I want to be putting a one into here. Oh, I want to be putting a zero in. When the clear is off, I want this to be zero. Uh, going in there. So... Force it to be zero. And when this is a one, that's a zero, so we just get whatever's coming from the previous uh, line. So when I do this, and I save the data coming in, then... Uh, I didn't get what I expected. Let me build my uh, circuitry for doing the clear control. Building in midair makes this a little bit trickier. Oh, that needs to be broken off. So 
So this is this pattern. Really is just this and a web. And then I just need the uh, clock signal coming in here as well. Um, well that's why then. Do it this way, it doesn't matter. That repeater versus torch just keeps all the timing in balance. Right now that's going to make no difference, but... Output here is one. What is the output here? Uh, okay, I'm gonna have to build myself some outputs because I'm getting confused as to where everything is. Uh, These are my outputs from this shifter. So when we do the clear, and then we disable the clear, so we, yeah, so we got 001, and I do the clock, I've got 010, clock again, and we failed. Why did it fail? Uh, okay, let's clear. Clock pulse. One's coming out and it's just fallen short by a block. That's why. That gets us 010. One zero zero, and then we should go back to the beginning again. Good. So we've now got the three phase generator. So that's fetch and decode, uh, PC increment, and execute, and then back to the beginning again. Brilliant. Um, the next challenge is to link up all of the clear signals. So we've got a clear for the memory, we've got a clear for the phase generator, and we've got a clear for the registers. And I think that's it. I think that's all the things that have a clear signal. Um, There, everything is zeros. Wondering why we're guessing a result. My reading from here that's causing that. Coming from the arithmetic unit. Uh, 
What the heck? The registers are all zero, except that are. All, all bits of this aren't clearing for some reason. Um, that should have zeroed everything now, hopefully. The output from our arithmetic unit. What? Where are they getting ones from? Uh, this is all zeros. All the way through, so where are these ones coming from? Is it just given up simulating these? Block is powered. What is going on? Hey, that's all zeros. Means that our arithmetic unit is all zeros. And yeah, our memory has not been zeroed, so it's just doing its thing. Right, so I need to link up these clear signals and uh, like I could try and fan this out from the middle but I think that's going to be more effort than it's worth. I've already built these signals. Um, what I'm going to do is try and just route this clear signal underneath in between these lines uh, so that it can reach the clear signal over here. And then I'll shift the two tick collect, uh, one tick pulse protection to somewhere else. So I don't want this to be coming through this gap if I can. deal with repeaters on this bit. Um, partly because I don't know where the signal is going to come into this in a moment. And again this protection and delete from here we'll put it somewhere else. Uh, that repeater needs to remain exactly where it is. That's the registers and memory clear signals and now I just need to link this clear signal to it.
And I'd like the clear signal to be up here so that the clock and phase control and everything is all in uh, one place right in the middle of the machine. Again, so that everything's within that simulation distance limit. So the clear signal's over here, so I can go quite a long way across like this. Oh, but I don't want to run into my decode signals. If I run into my decoded instructions, then uh, I'm going to end up in problems because I won't have space. Um, so I actually need to be going underneath these. At least I think I need to go underneath and in between multiplexer signals here. Uh, the data bus is for the arithmetic unit. Okay, so this is our clear. Again, do some stuff with repeaters here just to be absolutely sure that if I ever move this. And this is also where I can build that uh, one tick pulse protection. Build that in here before I forget about it. Here we go, and let's continue downwards. Okay, so we now have one centralized clear control for the entire system. And the only thing that we can really do here is get a phase signal uh, and to increment the program counter. So that should be what this is doing, but it's not. Find a little because I just.
Oh, the program counter increment is underneath, that's why I've selected the wrong one. There we go, uh, that's going to select the program counter increment, and uh, yeah, that's kind of the only thing we can do right now. Now I need to link together all of these clock signals, so there's a separate clock signal for each register, and one for the memory. Again, I want to bring it up here um, to have it all in the same place, but this time, because the clock signals are completely separate, I am going to try and fan it out from the middle to the edges. Um, and with any luck, I'll be able to do that by running a line all the way along here and just lift up the enable signals for each one to get them out of the way. The connection later from up above. Um, so just to test that theory, I do this, yeah. So these clock signals can all be linked together. So again, raising it up. Oh dear, I, I made that mistake here as well. I can just do that, I'll be fine. So the kind of center marker here is going to be our opcode register. So I'm going to bring power in by our repeater at this point here. So everything's going to be based on the clock signal coming in from there. So I can build repeaters based on that. Oops, easy. A little bit tricky to get this to just check that I built redstone on top of each of these. Very. Yep. And then bring this on 
cross. Where things might get a little messy because there's all these other uh, multiplexer control signals kicking around. Um, this was where we had the clock for the program counter before. This is our enable signal. I have left just the right amount of space to make this work. Hey. Oh, that was our last register anyway. This doesn't need to carry on. That's the clock input, and to bring that up where we want it, and then connect it up to the memories clock input. This is about to connect up to this block input here, hopefully. I'll work out how many boxes there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's the other side. Again, one tick protection on the clock so we don't accidentally break something. And the connection going down. We can make these a bit prettier later. Um, but for now, this is our global clear. This is our global clock. And so that power reaches all the way down and triggered all of the registers at once. Hopefully. And I have no idea what our B register is doing. Really no idea what it's doing. Uh, Why is this one bit? Is this because this is coming from the program counter? <laughs> yeah, so at the moment the program counter is being Selected along with the operand register, so I'll just disable all of those. Um, so hopefully, by do a global clear.
and then it would be quite nice to have a kind of visual for what our current and next program counters are. Um, this is our current program counter coming in, I think, inverse of our current program counter coming in. This is where our current program counter is, except for bottom bit. Going to hmm. Uh. I want this to line up, so. Our current program counter is zero, and if I just keep toggling the clock, we should see it increment if I've done that right. I... Uh, evidently haven't done this right. because I disabled the program counter. <laughs> okay, let me go and disable everything except the program counter for a minute. Um, disabled. That as well. I need to disable the memory as well. I haven't linked up the clock to the memory, but I know. Yeah, so disable the right operation on the memory. Cool. This is a negative edge triggered design, so we can now see on the negative edge the program counter is going to increment. And then the other thing I can do is this clock is going to be generated from uh, a circuit of repeaters going in a loop. And I can build that now, but with an extra feature, which will be uh, there's going to be an AND gate on it so that we can gate the clock uh, to disable it. Now I have no idea what the timings for this uh, processor are going to be. Um, genuinely not a clue how fast the clock is going to be able to go. Um, I will have to compute it later or figure it out later. So this will be our disable. And this is just a simple AND gate. Doesn't even matter actually, it can just be a NOR gate. Um, could have built this a bit differently, I guess, but anyway. So, usual way that you generate block. Now, because this is negative edge triggered, I'm actually gonna build an unbalanced uh, block here. Um, 
So uh, the positive edge will be the longest edge, so to speak. Um, yeah, I've done that wrong already. So I'm going to make the positive edge. Yeah, do this. Ah. Oh. I left it too late. There we go. So negative edge comes along and hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's a huge amount of clock skew across this circuit, so I don't know whether everything's going to save and update at the right times. It feels like this clock's possibly going to be too fast anyway. I have literally no idea how long it takes for stuff to get around and back again. Guess we'll find out when this program counter uh, reaches some of the upper bits. It'll be an extra like eight tick delay from where it is. At the moment, our loop is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven, twelve times four. So it's forty-eight ticks all the way round, but then we're not actually using can kind of discount for them. So we've got about a 44 tick delay at the moment. Uh, I have no idea if that's enough or not. Um, for the time being, I'll disable that and I'll connect up the clock and I think also I forgot that the clear here is inverted. Um, release it should be inverted. So that's where the power was running out. Because otherwise we'd be continuously clearing the memory, which we don't want. Um, that's right. Because I think our clear signals coming in here aren't inverted. No, I can't remember. I can't remember whether our clear on the memory is a negative logic signal or not. And now I can't figure it out. Uh, it's disabled one of the, and the... The clear is disabled one of our layers and columns and bytes should be enabled. Let's enable the write operation as well. And now for this one, which is byte zero, one of the clocks should be high and the other one should be low, but not what I'm being. Hello. Um, so our clear is not negative logic. Well, 
for his. Oh, our program counter's not cleared. That's why I'm getting confused. Ugh. So, clear out the program counter. And then I might be able to see whether the clear is negative logic by looking at this cell. Um, so, in this case, for that cell, if it was... Deal with this first. Um, Goes the clear. I haven't wired up the clock yet, that's still independent. One on, one off. What I'm looking for. One off, one on. Hey, so the clock was negative logic after all that faff. And now if I toggle the clock, we should see the opposite wires. Yeah, one on, one off, whereas before it was one off, one on. There we go. Okay, so the clear is correctly hooked up. Um, again, disable the write operation now to connect up this clock. Uh, bring this out the other way. Again, I'm going to try and go underneath the arithmetic unit data buses. Oh, and I'm one, one block out of sync. Damn, I don't mind. Would have been kind of convenient, but anyway. That, and fortunately the clock and clear are the opposite way around here, so I'm just going to have to overlap them.
So, I'm going to disable the clock for a moment, get it set up. Never mind. Yeah, that will do. So our clock is now running and I have no idea what the clock skew is. I have no idea whether this works in terms of data being saved, etc, etc. Um, what I am going to do is plug the program counter into the arithmetic unit and Use that as the so use the arithmetic unit as the input for the A register and enable the A register to save. So on every clock edge, the data input to our um, memory is going to change. The A register is changing, the program counter is changing and so on and so forth, and then I'm going to look at the inputs to the operand register to see when they update, because I will also enable the write operation. So this will take the data from the previous cycle's uh, memory and save it into the memory. Now, this may be going too fast for the memory, in which case it would be requesting that it saves it before we really know what's going on. Um, I don't really want the address to keep changing. So what I'm going to do is force the address to be all ones. Um, but that way we're always saving into uh, the same address. It'll be the top corner. And actually the, the rear row here is going to be the slowest. So we should now be saving, tell you what, uh, I can also destroy this to make sure that we're not adjusting the row all the time. So we should now be saving into the backmost row, top left hand bit. Uh, is that actually going to be the slowest though? That may not be the slowest because our right hand column here is the one that receives the data last. But anyway, uh, it's also the one that outputs last. So that's not the third. We actually want to be selecting the first column each time, which means drawing these bits of wire, essentially. Topmost row, right hand column first, uh, like back row, byte, and with any luck that's the one we're selecting, yes. So there's the data, and we should be able to see our clock pulses coming through here. 
Yeah. And our data output is over here somewhere. And our data input's over there, which we can't see because the lamps are covered up. So we should be seeing the data output here essentially increment by one each time. Yeah. The data output there is incrementing by one each time. And it is actually getting time with which to do that. Um, the next question is whether the data lines here are able to keep up. Um, in fact, the data lines here are all zero, which suggests something's going slightly wrong, actually. This is our data output. And gone wrong. Oh, damn. The thing that's gone wrong is I tested against the, I tested the repeaters against uh, switches that were on here rather than, um, rather than anywhere else. So I now need to boost the power that's coming from the rear outputs. That's going to be incorrect on all of these, I think. In fact, if I enable this bit here and or what's coming from there, that's okay. Um, Right, so all these need additional repeaters to make this work. Do that across every bit of the output. Tedious. Correct. Such a compact, fiddly, all space but wires. Right now, I can't think of an efficient way of doing this. So if you're just joining the stream, I'm fixing a bug in the memory outputs where the power from the rear row, the row behind me, didn't reach far enough forwards. Um, and as a result, power wasn't coming out uh, far enough down these ladders going down. Um, and as a result, data wasn't output correctly. Um, it looks like we've now fix that problem on uh, the topmost layer. I now need to go through fixing it on all the layers. Uh, every single bit of every single layer needs the same correction. I think, see, maybe not, maybe it's just the topmost layer. Hmm, let's see. If I'm lucky, this will reach to tell when there's power coming from above. It looks like that power is definitely 
reaching, so it was only the topmost layer that really had a bug. Uh, because I think I designed all of these, all the rest of these, exactly the same in terms of having repeaters on these blocks. Great, so that was the only one that I really messed up, it was the topmost layer. Um, now I should be seeing the data output on these lines and it should gradually increase by one each time. Uh, obviously we have to view it from this direction to really see what's going on. Hmm. Things not quite happening as I expected there. Maybe I accidentally left a test wire in or something. That all looks okay. Uh, ooh, that's interesting. There are some lights on over here. Which there. Oh, that is just these ones. These outputs should be changing more frequently and to other values. Uh, I wonder whether some of our bits aren't quite being powered properly. I'm now going to manually test all of our That's manually switched on all of our bits, and we'll now see if any of them fail. Uh, doesn't look like they have. They should have been adding one each time through, uh, if everything was running correctly. Because um, the program count is just incrementing. So on these outputs it is. Oh, I deleted a wire, that's why. When I was testing, I forgot to rebuild it. So hopefully we now see the outputs over here incrementing correctly. Again, we have to look at it from this angle to see the increment. So read this backwards uh, on these lines. Good. And then hopefully this data reaches all the way to the end here. Uh, and if I orient myself correctly, we can see this as, uh, yeah, this way around, we can read it as a binary number from left to right. Um, with the low bit on the right, high bit on the left. So usual, usual order usual bit order. Okay, so that's incrementing correctly. And then what I'm anxious to see is whether the increment is finishing before the next program counter. Update comes along, so before the next clock edge comes along. So all of these should have been done updating before I see the next negative edge of the clock.
It's really fine at the moment if we watch. So uh, let me change my field of view to make this a little bit easier. So if I increase the field of view just a little bit. So the clock edge is there and there and then the clock edge. Increment and the clock edge. So it's really fine at the moment. Um, so that's not really okay. We need it to be less uh, close than that. So I'm going to massively increase the delay here. Now one of the other problems with a clock edge machine is like uh, the clock skew. So the data in one part of the system might update for another part of the system. Um, and then the new data might race around and reach the part of the system that hasn't yet updated before it was supposed to uh, be a really serious problem. Let's just try and get this clock set up correctly because I've just done a bad job of it. So there we go. Now I can Okay, so hopefully there'll be less of a So there's now a much bigger gap between, so there's the negative clock edge, there's the data update, there's the next negative clock edge. So there's now much more of a gap in between them. Um, so I'm a bit more confident that this might work. If I fly down to the end here, it's these, this is essentially the furthest point in that loop. Um, so data update, negative clock edge. And again, the clock skew here, makes this a bit tricky to evaluate whether it's really going to work. Um, so I'll think about that offline, um, not in the live stream. Uh, I think it's a bit more complicated than I can figure out. Uh, essentially, it just means flying around measuring stuff, trying to see, which is a bit boring. Uh, and this stream's now two hours long. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, thanks for watching. This now seems to mostly be working. We have our opcode register. Uh, we have our clear signals linked up, we have the phase generation, and the clocks are linked up. Um, so the last thing for tomorrow uh, will be to essentially build the control path and link up the uh, clock phase into those uh, decoded signals as well. And then we'll be able to program the memory and attempt to run a program, which I've yet to write, but I'll figure it out. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow. We're almost done. Yeah, this is exciting. <laughs>